Hello, hello. Oh, they're starting. Hi, everyone. Hopefully, you hello. all can hear us. Um, welcome to the Trans Mask Q and A panel. Um, I'm Pongo, and this is. Hello, my name's Essek. I go by he, they pronouns, and I am a trans man. Uh, I go by he, they as well. I forgot to mention that. Oops. <laughs> Crimson. Uh, I'm Crimson. I'm a new hire. My pronouns are they, them. I'm gender fluid and trans mask. Awesome. Awesome. All right. We're going to get started here. Let's go to our first slide. Oh, before we do that, I want to mention um, all the background art is done by our wonderful staff member, Essek, over here. Um, so this lovely pink, blue trans background for the slides is all Essek. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about like socially transitioning and what that looks like from the trans male perspective. Um, so for part of the uh, panel we that we'll get into later, we did like a Q and A um, with a Google form in the Trans Mass channel, asking all of y'all in the community, um, you know, what do you want to know about the Trans Mask experience? Uh, so we're each gonna like talk a little bit about like how our transition. Uh, has gone on because uh, we all have different stories right we all have different journeys um mm -hmm. do either of you want exactly. to start um talking about like socially transitioning and like just a little bit about like uh maybe coming out or like name change or like telling the audience a little bit about like um where you are in your transition so yeah, socially transitioning, um, at least for me, it started with how I dressed. I started buying more masculine clothing and, you know, for the longest time and people were just like, oh, they're a tomboy type of thing. But it's like more than that. I started seeing more and more of myself in the mirror by expressing myself through clothing and also masculine makeup also helps um, in earlier stages of that. Um, Picking out a name was kind of kind of challenging for me. There's so many names to pick from. And of course, I went with the most basic one, not doxing myself. Um, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but anyone else want to talk a little bit more? <laughs> um, Essek or I can go. Um... <laughs> so a little bit about myself. Um, I first uh, came out to myself as genderqueer. I was sort of sim in the similar boat as um, Crimson over here. Um, only I labeled myself as genderqueer. I was trans mask. And then slowly, I believe it was in 2017, I made the decision uh, to go on testosterone. And I've been on testosterone, um, I'm going to say, wow, for the last like eight years now. And um, I still don't have top surgery, um, but I mainly have just been on hormones for a long time. I got my legal name change um, back in 2018. So legally I am male. I've been on testosterone for a while. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much how my journey has gone so far. What about you, Pablo? Awesome. Um, yeah, so actually me and Essek have similar transition timelines which is pretty funny um so i think my egg cracked quote unquote or like coming out to myself happened uh around the end of high school i think i was about 17. uh i started like noticing like oh my gosh this is gender dysphoria like i'm trans this is wild um i started like slowly transitioning into masculine clothing which being afab um it is, I feel like, a nice transition um, because, you know, like people think you're a tomboy or maybe a lesbian. Um, so at first, when I was like 16, I came out as gay um, and I was, you know, starting to figure things out. By 17, 
Uh, I came out as non-binary at first. I wasn't sure exactly what label I wanted to go with. So I went from my birth name to a nickname of my birth name, uh, which I was already being called a lot at home. So it was an easier, more neutral name. Um, and I started with, you know, going up to my friends that I was really close with in high school and saying, hey, do you mind, you know, calling me they, them pronouns? Like I'm coming out as trans. And uh, lucky for me, I was very blessed to have wonderful friends, most of which were already queer uh, themselves. And so they were like, yeah, of course. Like, and they were super excited and helpful about uh, trying to pick out a name. Like Crimson said, it, it's uh, it's hard at first. Uh, I had to look through a lot of lists of like baby names and dog name lists because there isn't really good options online I found of like, how do you name yourself, right? Usually that's your parents' job or something. Um, but yeah, I was looking <laughs> through names and unfortunately I'm also a stereotypical name. Not going to dox myself though. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, no, but um, it's, you know, it's awkward at first, uh, like first haircut, first time using like the opposite bathroom first time shopping in the other section of the store um but like oh, as yeah. the years went on like i feel like i got a little more comfortable right um i have also been on hrt for about the same time as essex uh so i think i started hrt mm, i want to say beginning of 2017 actually um and i'm pre-op still uh hopefully uh top surgery one day um, but I'm not sure exactly on my plans for that. Um, yeah. Oh, and my legs, ugh, my name, my name is legally changed in my gender marker as well. Uh, after I started testosterone, I got all of that done. I was lucky enough to have a wonderful nonprofit, uh, in real life, help me with some of the fees and the court process and all that paperwork, which was really, really nice. Cause otherwise it would have been like, $350 like USD at the time, which, you know, <laughs> I mm -hmm. couldn't afford, unfortunately, now. but yes, exactly. So, um, there is some organizations out there that do help with that, which is amazing. Um, anything else? Crimson Essex? Um, no, I had something and then it just like floated away. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> If you got something, go for it. I was like, <laughs> otherwise no, we can move I, on I'm to the next good. slide. Yeah, I was um, gonna say we can move on because I do want to touch up on this a bit. Yeah, that's fine. All right, so the next slide is binding. binding. Um, and our lovely artwork again was made <laughs> by Essek, our wonderful staff member. <laughs> Essek is an amazing artist and sh it shows us in these images on, I'm looking at the ground because I can see the PowerPoint, but <laughs> um, but the lovely PowerPoint has the different binding options. Um, so what is binding? For those who don't know what chest binding is, um, a lot of trans mask individuals have chest dysphoria. Um, being assigned female at birth, uh, a lot of people have a chest and that causes dysphoria uh being trans mask for most people uh that i've noticed and so a lot of people will choose one of the options on the screen uh to try to conceal or flatten their chest in different ways um so here we have a half tank binder a full tank binder and something called trans tape uh which is like a sticky adhesive temporary uh it's similar to medical tape if you're familiar with that um and that would uh stick on and like pull back the skin a little bit um and then it's removable with like uh wipes or like the shower or something so it's just you know for one day um the other options are um uh, i wouldn't say similar to a bra but it like it flattens instead of Enunciates or you know lifts oh, if that makes sense. Yeah, compression. Yeah, it compresses. Yeah, yeah. There's like a certain way you like just fold your stuff in there mm -hmm. so you can get the most. Um, yeah, flat. <laughs> exactly. It does wonders for for flatness and passing and making 
people feel more euphoric, like the opposite of dysphoria. I know that my first binder was not the best binder because I got it from some random website. But at the time, like that was all I could afford. That was all I could get without my parents figuring it out, right? So you got to do what you got to do. Um, but yeah, now there's a lot of companies that are trans owned that, you know, give binders either for free or raffles. You know, they they hand out bi binders to uh, trans youth in need. Um, I know my local organizations mm -hmm. near where I live do that, which is wonderful that people are doing that. Um, most of the sales for binding um, is actually online, which is not that accessible right now. Um, but there is, you know, some options for um, how to make things with clothing, like look a little bit different in a safe way. Um, Cause safe binding is super, super important. Um, and yeah, that was at least one of the core. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was just going to say, like, do not wear it all day and all. Because as soon as I got my first binder, I was like, I'm not leaving this. <laughs> I'm going to live in here. And yeah. that's, that's a mistake. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah, no, it can actually be a really, really serious medical issue. People have broken mm -hmm. ribs. Um, so it's no joke. Um, so things like duct tape or like other things that aren't a binder or tape are not medically appropriate um doctors and the people yeah, that make binders that. <laughs> highly advise you not to do that because that's not safe um if you need help finding a binder or like funding for a binder if you look in our resources channel i have a lovely google doc which i know a few of you are familiar with mm -hmm. uh that lists a bunch of different like binders and ways to get binders and how to bind safely and all of that and of course uh the panel and all of the panels will be on Twitch live stream currently, and as well as you can watch all of it later on the YouTube channel, which is wonderful. Thank you, media team. I appreciate you. Yes, um, yes. Hmm. Oh, there's also swim binders. Um, it's a cool new thing that makes it easier to go to like a water yes. park or a pool with your friends. Um, yeah. Anything they else? even has. Oh, I was going to go on adding yeah. on to that. Um, they even have, like, um, besides just having, like, I guess you would have, like, the uh, the the board short um, top mm -hmm. that they have for people. Um, they do have special swim tops. Um, yes. I actually was very fortunate, and I got one, and I showed it um, in our um, Transmass channel as well. Oh, I love and... that. <laughs> Yeah, so okay. it, it's it's come a long way from like years and years ago. Because mm -hmm. um, I remember when I first came out. I mean, obviously, when I first came out as gender queer is very different. But when I first came out, it was like maybe one company that had binders yep. and uh, Underworks is a company that gets mentioned, and I think they were literally the only company. And it wasn't even for trans people; it was for. Um, cis men that have a uh, gynecomastasia there and people mm. and trans people were taking these compression tops and saying hey we're going to use this uh to reduce uh breast dysphoria so that's how that got started yeah and then it wasn't um, until underworks noted mm. that that they were like oh we can make this for trans people so it's really yeah cool. we can market to trans people because it's it's a very similar need as like the cis um cis men that have that condition mm -hmm. it basically forms like breast tissue right um because as i'm assuming a lot of you know like gender is a spectrum and nature is beautiful and does all sorts of wonderful things right um yep so everyone's a little bit different um okay i think that is our binding slide let's go mm -hmm. to the next one Let's see. Okay, HRT, um, or testosterone in our case. <laughs> um, <laughs> Crimson? Okay. Um, I just started the gel option, Andro Gel. I started it actually maybe two months ago, and my care plan's going perfect, like, according to plan. Awesome. Um, I actually don't have to pay for testosterone because I'm poor and 
uh, where I live, I'm able to I'm able right. to get it free of cost. I'm so privileged and lucky. Thank you. <laughs> um, me too. Nonprofit organization for helping me. Um, and uh, I chose Andrew Gel, the gel option, because I am gender fluid and I want to be more androgynous. I'm. Uh, what do you call it? I just kind of want to go at a slow and steady pace for my transition, at least medically talking. Um, I don't even know what kind of surgeries I would want. And, you know, the, at first, when I first um, kind of figured out that I was trans, um, I didn't even know that gel was an option. So I thought that was going to be a barrier for me because I'm afraid of needles. So I didn't even want to, like, think about that kind of stuff. And it, it made me feel like I was closed in a box for a long time. So I, I'm really grateful that I was able to get gel and then have... Um, affordable gel it's super affordable it's free <laughs> yeah um i was also surprised by how many options Absolutely. there was because i wasn't too familiar like at first i had only heard about injections um which is one of the options and one of the more common options especially with people first starting they want you know all of the uh side effects and like things like hair growth uh your voice deepening things like that they, they're like, okay, I want all the changes super quick. And so a lot of people, either their insurance will only cover one form of uh, HRT or they heard from their friends like, oh, this one worked well for me. Um, but it really depends on like your medical situation, like talking to your doctor, like some forms work better for some people versus others. So definitely talk to your doctor about getting on the proper form for you. Um, I've tried a few different types of HRT actually over the years. I started on subcutaneous, uh, which is an injection um, with um, like your fat, like stomach area. Some other people will do like arm or like backside at different places. Uh, depends on how your doctor wants you to do it. They'll tell you like the angle of it, mm -hmm. um, how to draw it out. They'll teach you like at the doctor's office how to do it properly. Um, there's also some wonderful like tutorial videos online on um safely applying things um there also actually is an hrt pill for testosterone now which i <laughs> i've heard it tastes bad has weird side effects i'm gonna be honest with you and you have to take it twice a day um mm -hmm. which before yeah. was not an option uh yeah <laughs> um there's uh hrt patches uh which is the uh androderm patches um and some people were allergic to the adhesive uh personally for me they were kind of falling off with like hair and sweat it wasn't really working so i switched methods uh i haven't tried the gel but i have heard it's good however it can like transfer onto like uh, a friend or a partner or a pet and so you just have to be a little cautious to make sure it's dried all the way um, and then this last option with the U.S. currency dime over here, that is actually a testo pellet. Um, and so your doctor oh, yeah. would do an in-office procedure uh, to insert testosterone pellets, uh, which is similar to like a gel form. Um, the pellet will dissolve in uh, your muscle fat tissue. Um, and then it takes a slow dose of testosterone over the course of a few months. It's really cool. Um, so that I would only have to go in like every couple months, uh, which was the last method I tried. I'm currently on long-term injections, which are every 10 weeks in office. Yeah. <laughs> oh, nice. Essek? <laughs> uh, yeah, so I've been on... Um, shots for, I would say, the majority of my transition. Um, eventually, I believe I'll go into the um, the subdermal and set, kind of like a set it and forget it kind of thing. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. I, a funny story that I wanted to bring up was, um, <laughs> so I remember the first uh, vial that my nurse gave me, she's like, I'm gonna write down the date of your first injection because Aww. you're gonna forget. And I'm like, 
And I'm like, so sweet. there's no way I'm going to, re- I'm going to forget this, this historic time in my life. And literally <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. Like now, five years later, well, you know, like now eight years later, I'm like, when did I first take testosterone? Was it in <laughs> April, June? Like, exactly. But I, I did not believe her. I was like, oh man, like time really does fly. Like in the beginning stages. You're yeah, like, it does. I, I, I don't know if this stuff is going to work. What if, <laughs> what if I'm unchangeable? <laughs> and now yeah, I'm like, no. Yeah, I, I guess, I guess this started, Ben. But yeah, definitely. Mm. I, I have my vial somewhere. I got to look for it, put it in the archives, I guess. But oh, yeah, she I literally wish I had wrote, my first wrote stuff. the date. Yeah, the first. <sighs> the first vial of testosterone that I've ever taken. And Aww. and Liz, if you're watching this, thank you. Thank you for Aww. writing it down. And <laughs> <laughs> That's so cute. Um, thank you. I also had some yeah. pretty good experiences uh, with nurses, but not that adorable. <laughs> I actually have a transition binder. Um, that mm-hmm. I started with my doctor as well. Like oh, I've been journaling oh. every day since I've been taking it. Cause she's like, you mm-hmm. should write down your thing. Cause I, I check in with her like every three months. So just like yeah. mentally, physically, um, how I'm feeling like throughout the day kind of thing. Yeah. And also it has like my medical stuff, like in little page protectors mm-hmm. in the front too. And it has like mm-hmm. pride stickers all over it. Okay. I, I really love my little journal thing. Oh, that's cute. Are are you also on like about a three month routine for blood work check ins? I know that's pretty common. Yeah. yeah. So uh, at least with the injections and a lot of the forms of HRT, you might check in every like one to three months with your doctor. You know, make sure your hormone levels for estrogen and testosterone are where they would be for like a cis individual of your age range. Uh, you know, they want to make sure you're healthy and happy with the results, and you know, you want to make sure your body's taking it well, right? Um, so that's super, super important, um, because otherwise it could be a safety risk if you don't check in with doctors. Um, oh, another thing I wanted to mention is there is a, like, auto injector, like, people that have, like, they're a little bit worried about, like, needles for, like, injections for HRT. There's something called an auto injector, um, which is, like, a plastic thing that you put the syringe, um, in, and then you, like, just, like, press down, and it, like, will do it for you almost um so it's a little less scary from what i've heard uh i've also in the past had like a friend or a partner that i was dating be like hey you know can you can you help me out can you do this for me yes i would you know i would get distracted play on my phone real quick and then they just go for it that way it's a little bit easier because even though i'm not really afraid of needles anymore when you start doing it weekly you get kind of like a needle anxiety sometimes at least from from me, my experience, and what I've heard from a few other people, it gets to be a little much, and you don't want to, you know, miss a dose because that's not good. Um, so that's why I'm on long term now. It's a little bit easier. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then, um, m- missing a dose with gel, it actually doesn't. Not that it doesn't matter, but you can go a, a day and, and it'll be fine. Yeah. Oh, so, like gel, me. gel is a day, a patch is a day. Uh, The pills are twice a day. Uh, The injections are usually, from what I've heard, like, and what I've done, uh, once a week or once every other week, depending on your doctor and your dosage. Uh, And the other methods are more long-term, like the 10-week long-term injection or, like, the um, testo pellets every couple months. So there is many options for, like, insurance. Some places, like Planned Parenthood and other places do sliding scale. Um, so really it's up to like you and your doctor, like what method works best for you. Uh, I think mm-hmm. we're ready to go to the next slide. Okay. All right. Here's more wonderful art. This art was not done by Essex. This art was actually done by Jude, uh, one of the trans mask, uh, TA community members. Um, so here we mm-hmm. have two types of top surgery. Um, the person holding the cute little blaha uh, has double incision scars. And then the other person with his, his hands up like that um, has more of a keyhole uh, top surgery scar. Mm. Um, yeah. Um, so there is 
a few different types of top surgery. And that's basically a um, gender affirming surgery that some mask or non-binary people might opt into to relieve some chest dysphoria, basically. Uh, so you wouldn't need to necessarily wear a binder anymore because uh, it'd be relatively flat, uh, similar to like a, a cis man's chest. Mm -hmm. Or even yeah, so the, like the doctor... uh, do the tape anymore. That too, yeah. I was going to say, and with the doctor, <laughs> obviously, if you have a good doctor, um, they'll make sure that your chest is proportioned to your body. So if you are mm -hmm. um, of a higher, like, fat level, like, they're not going to sink in your chest. They're going to proportion yeah. pr proportion it to you the way you fit. Exactly. Um, so important. that's, like, one. Yes. <laughs> um, as a mm -hmm. chubbier trans mask myself, I know that, like, when looking into... Uh, top surgeons. I went to visit like at least three different top surgeons. I got uh, a bunch of people online saying, hey, if you go to this city or this town nearby, they'll take your insurance. Uh, the doctor has good bedside manner. They're super, super nice and helpful. All the nurses were super supportive. Uh, recovery was easy. No complications. And then other people had, you know, opposite stories, right? Complications, other things. But just like any surgery, there's always going to be, you know, the a small percentage of people that, you know, aren't having a good time. Um, so there's actually, I saw a statistic recently that was like, more people regret like knee surgery than uh, gender affirming surgery, which, uh, yeah, we'll have to look that one up later because that's pretty funny to me, <laughs> uh, which it makes sense though, right? Um, <laughs> but yeah, I know definitely yeah. to a bunch of uh, make sure they take your insurance and ask them a lot of questions about like how drains work if you're doing double incision time off of work mm -hmm. accommodations all of that fun stuff whoever go for it <laughs> <laughs> i don't have anything to add because i don't even think that um top surgery might be in my care plan or my goal i mean <laughs> mm-hmm yeah um it's different for everyone uh everything's optional right you don't need to do hrt if you don't want to you don't need to do top surgery or bottom surgery if you don't want to everyone's like gender journey is different um and that's what's wonderful so whatever helps you to feel comfortable and confident beautiful handsome and amazing within yourself is what's important um yeah i mean exactly. i'm pretty sure i'm gonna get top surgery but you never know so yeah no it, it's all yeah. based on yourself and your preferences whatever mm -hmm. makes you feel it, and look like yourself like how you feel on the inside that's what you should do and it doesn't make you any less trans if you don't want to go the operation route or exactly. even like hrt route kind of thing exactly. whatever you feel you are that's who you are exactly and i feel like a lot of people also forget like uh some people can't afford certain options right maybe they live in a country yes. where these things aren't accessible to them nearby maybe they don't have insurance or maybe they can't afford uh hrt or surgery out of pocket right so let's keep in mind that some yeah. of our trans friends uh aren't you know aren't as privileged as maybe some of us were in our transition um that doesn't make them less trans right um so exactly that's important to keep in mind with like the journey of transitioning uh there's no like everyone's end goal might look different some people focus on passing some people focus on just feeling confident everyone's different um also like some people uh medically speaking like might not be able to like physically have a surgery maybe they have a medical condition or they're disabled uh i know for me that's a worry since i'm I have some disability issues, which I won't get into in detail, of course. But um, yeah, no, that's also a concern for me. Um, and that's something I have to think about when I, how recovery would look for top surgery for me. Um, yeah, so all yeah. all super important things. <laughs> to Absolutely. Consider. Yep. Um, and uh, let's go ahead and go on our next slide. Yeah, also, real quick, I wanted to say, um, in, uh, 
the uh, Google Doc uh, resource page, I tried to type out like some good questions about like what I asked like my top surgeons when I went in for the initial consult and like some more information uh, about like, you know, how to find a good uh, LGBT friendly therapist in your area so that you might be able to get like a top surgery letter, like what informed consent looks like uh, for those types of things. Uh, Cause some do want you to be on HRT or a certain BMI, uh, like body mass index, uh, to make sure surgery is right for you and safe beforehand. Um, so definitely look into it a little bit before you're ready for the actual surgery. Um, sometimes people are booked up a few months if they're specialists or surgeons. Um, and of course we can cover any of these topics in the trans Academy discord after the fact as well. I'd be happy to. Uh, discuss this more later and answer anybody's questions. Speaking of questions, we got some wonderful questions from our community. Um, so we put out a Google form. And the first mm -hmm. question is, what are your tips for coming out? A few people asked us this. Um, and a few people also mentioned they had an unaccepting family or they're still living at home with their parents, maybe. Um, so what, what, what do y'all think? Who would like to go first? Um, <laughs> Essek? <laughs> oh, certainly. Um, so I think like one of my biggest things is, is safety is number one, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not trying to say like, you know, oh, don't come out or whatever, but safety is number one. If you feel like, honestly, that, you know, coming out is going to endanger you for whatever reason, like think of your safety first and foremost, you don't owe anybody an explanation. You know, mm -hmm. you just want to keep yourself safe. In fact, if I was being completely honest, like I waited until I was pretty much of age of where I was uh, an adult where I could, mm -hmm. you know, if something, if my parents did disagree or any of my other family disagreed, it wasn't just my parents, mm -hmm. um, I would be able to survive the fallout if there was any fallout, right? Um, mm -hmm. So make sure you're safe. That's the first thing I would suggest. And also, um, sometimes people can actually pleasantly surprise you. Um, True. <laughs> like people that, yeah, like people that I thought were going to make a big deal out of it were actually pretty chill about it. It's not that they didn't care, but they were very like understanding about it. It, it went a lot, some people, it just went a lot smoother than I anticipated. Um, but yes, safety, number one, I just want to reiterate that. So, um, <laughs> yeah, <and> yes. <laughs> I, I was going to say the exact same thing. That is literally the first uh, bullet point I have on there as like a talking point is safety is most important. Uh, what you made me think about, Essek, is the phrase, uh, prepare for the worst, hope for the best, right? So, you know, you exactly. want to have backup plans if things go south, but you also want to stay hopeful. Um, I know for me, like, I planned on, you know, like, writing out a little speech, like, preparing what I was going to say ahead of time. Uh, me and my partner at the time had a long conversation about, like, how is this going to go? Uh, you know, do I want a partner or a friend to go to my parents with me? Am I going to do it at the house? Am I going to do it in public at a restaurant or something? Uh, what day, what time? Like I had it all planned. Well, all those plans flew out the window pretty much. And I ended up just, uh, <laughs> just saying it, uh, within like two sentences and then running away. <laughs> um, I was so nervous. I was shaking. Um, and crying, and my parents were very confused, of course. Um, I mean, they had a lot of warning signs, and they had already asked me a hundred times if I wanted to be a boy, but it still wasn't obvious, I guess. The denial was very hard for them. Um, 
which is a whole nother story. But basically, like I had a backup plan. It wasn't the end of the world. I eventually talked to my parents again and we're okay. Um, but that I know that isn't the case for everyone. Um, I ended up coming out at 18 when I felt like I was safe enough and comfortable, comfortable enough to, uh, I was able to have resources and, you know, community in place, some chosen family, some friends, a partner at the time. So that if I needed to stay at someone else's house or, you know, have support, uh, emotionally that, you know, I could call a friend and that's, what's important is, you know, having people around you that support you regardless of how a reaction might go, you know, good or bad. Um, Crimson. (laughs) For me, I am very privileged to have an accepting family. Um, I wasn't expecting it. It was a pleasant surprise. My grandparents raised me and we were actually very involved with our church. I went to CCD, which is religious education for children. Super. Um, uh, so I was not expecting getting the Encanto ending in my case where I was literally, I was shaking and crying off the table, trying to get words out to tell my grandparents I'm non-binary because I, I came out as non-binary first and I'm changing my name mm. and these are my pronouns. I was... I was a little bit older. I was, I was like 20. It was just a few years ago. Um, and I was shaking, crying. And I, I, it was so weird because I was expecting the worst, but hoping for the best. And my grandparents both told me they loved me and they apologized that I was scared to tell them in the first place. And they just said, I, all I had to do was be myself. And that was enough for them. And I just wasn't expecting that, honestly. Um, I was thinking about my safety. I I felt pretty safe to come out. Um, And I didn't have a plan, but I did have a chosen family. My partner at the time was actually the first person to use my, my preferred name and pronouns even before I came out to my family and friends. And it just, that was like our little secret for like a year before it came out. And it was really great. Oh, so yeah, it Aww. was it was really nice. <laughs> I, I breathe um, really easy at home. There were some family members that were obviously I don't have to interact with them, on, but my immediate family was was very accepting. Mm-hmm. So yeah. <laughs> All right, I think we're gonna move on to the next slide. Um, let's see. Okay, uh, the next question we had is, what is something that you didn't expect when you first started transitioning? Uh, Essek or Crimson? Um, For me, medically, I did a lot of research. I had a lot of time. I researched for maybe like seven years. So I looked at like multiple timetables for um, HRT transitioning and such. But what I was not expecting, which I should have been (laughs) the first thing I should have expected, actually, um, socially transitioning, or at least working somewhere as a trans person is very excruciating. But on the other side of that, (laughs) the camaraderie (laughs) that you find with other trans people is like nothing else, really. Like we're all here in the same boat and we all have each other and it just makes things so much more bearable. But yeah, I, I just wasn't expecting literally coworkers being horrible for no reason other than you existing. Oh my. Uh-huh. Yeah. Do I have a story for that <laughs> that is not for the panel? Um, <laughs> um, yeah, no. Um, something you didn't expect when you first started transitioning. Hmm. Oh, <laughs> I have a funny story. Um. Oh, I didn't expect people to think that I was my own brother. Um, (laughs) one time I, uh, Ah, it was, you know, towards the end of high school. And I don't know if any other trans people in the audience had a weird experience like this, but I was getting into the car with a friend who I hadn't seen in a very long time. Well, if you can imagine, HRT changes a few things, right? So I did not look like a girl. I looked like a man. And my friend and my other friend who I hadn't seen in a while ago, 
hey, you know, my name, get in the car, you know, here's my other friend. And they go, oh, are you birth name's brother? And I go, what? I don't have a brother. I am birth name, or I was. And then they got really confused and very embarrassed and red in the face and started panicking. And uh, yeah, uh, I had to out myself to a friend that already knew me. It was kind of interesting. I mean, they knew, but like they didn't know. Um, they were fine with it. It just was like awkward for a minute. And then they were kind of laughing it off. Like, I'm so embarrassed that I didn't know who you were. Uh, yeah, so I don't have a brother. I am the brother now. <laughs> I have two sisters. I don't have a brother. I am the brother. Um, <laughs> so that was not what I was expecting. <laughs> I would have just ran with it. I would have took the new identity and just... <laughs> Yes. That's yeah, I, I mean, I guess so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I would say um, like uh, one. Oh, go ahead. No, no. <laughs> oh. Um, I was gonna say one thing. I did not expect as like a side effect of transitioning was more of like a physical. Um. Sometimes it happens. It doesn't happen to every trans person, but I started feeling like a little bit of like an Adam's apple, like in my throat a bit. So um, mm. it's from the testosterone. And I was like, there's no yeah. way this is happening. But yeah, no. And, and yeah. You do, kind of, <laughs> you do kind of feel it a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, so, but it's a, again, it's a weird sensation. So gradual. Mm -hmm. Things happen so gradually you don't even notice it, but it it happens. It really does. <laughs> one day you one day you wake up and you have like three random hairs sticking out of your chin, and you're like, "Oh, I might have a beard uh, coming up soon." Um, yeah, no, it's it's kind of funny sometimes, um, and it's even funnier when you forget you're trans or you forget your friend is trans. Yeah, that's happened. Uh, Oh, yes. <laughs> when you reach a, when you reach a level of passing where you forget your trans friend is trans and you make a comment uh and then they go you know that i'm trans right <laughs> yeah no that's pretty funny i didn't expect that to happen either um but it it took you know a little bit of passing and a little bit of euphoria and comfortability and eventually like you'll get to a spot hopefully uh in your own transition where you'll just be able to relax and just be a person and you're not thinking about trans things on a daily basis. Um, I mean, I am cause I'm staff here, but <laughs> um, yeah. It kind of yeah, like slowly, that's my job. I mean, yeah. It's sort of like Going. very slowly becomes background noise, but it, it takes a, it takes a bit. It takes a bit. Um, I'm lagging a little bit. I'm sorry. Whoop. Um. <laughs> All right. Whoop. The next slide. Wow, am I lagging? <laughs> All right. Are we good to go to the next slide? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, what advice do you have for cis or trans femme authors? for writing a trans mask character that might be something that we would overlook? Um, I think this is a Ooh, wonderful question, like question and a very unique question as well. Anyone want to go for it first? Okay. <laughs> I'll go first. If, if you think that there's enough angst, no, there isn't. Add more. There's so much angst. There's so much angst. Okay, no. Oh my um, gosh. But no... <laughs> <laughs> Literally, <laughs> trans mass people experience from such a young age that they're not strong enough, they're not big enough, they're not like the other guys kind of thing. So, you know, it, it's unmeasurable how how <laughs> much we are stressed out actually all the time. Um, and then there's physical <laughs> factors you can also account for as well. Just do your research about depending on how far along you're writing your character, um, like binding, packing, mm -hmm. and po post-op stuff too. Just make sure you yeah. do research on that. I would say 
uh, for writing any uh, character for like a book or TV show or whatever you're writing, uh, make sure you ask someone in that community that has like lived experience of said thing, right? That is the most important thing about diversity writing, I could probably say. Um, that doesn't just go for like trans mass characters, that goes for literally everything. If you're trying to write a perspective that you've never experienced before, go ask that person, hey, you've had this thing. How would you like it to be written? What would you like to see in a book? And so that's why I love this question so much. Um, for me personally, like I think when it comes to like writing a certain character, unless the book is like focused on the main character's transition, I don't think personally that the like side character or supporting characters should focus on their transition right so they're just another friend or a sibling or a cousin or a neighbor they're they have a whole personality and a whole life besides being trans right and i can imagine all of you know that as exactly. well right we're people and then we also happen to be trans right we have a job and we also happen to be trans um so i think writing in that way is like a good way to think about it um maybe somewhere in the book uh, the neighbor says, oh, I use these pronouns. Or maybe somewhere in the book, uh, the person says, oh, I'm coming out. You know, But if that's the main focus in their whole personality, it becomes a little problematic and not tasteful mm -hmm. from what I've experienced. <laughs> yeah. Um, Essek? Uh, Essek? Yeah, I was actually, actually going to go around and say... Um, sort of like segueing from what Pongo was explaining to, I would say like, you know, if, especially if you're doing like a trans masculine or a trans man character, I would say like, again, you know, talk to, uh, interview trans men. Um, I would even say something that I, that I personally haven't seen a lot of is a lot of voices of trans men of color. Um, so that's something like they, you know, if you are doing a character that is uh, trans masculine or a trans man, I mean, we kind of have like this weird stereotype where it's like, you know, the, or, I mean, I hate to say it, but it's sort of like, a, you know, the chicken or the egg thing with society. A lot of people expect trans men to be like these thin, you know, white, twinkish, waifish kind of uh like pre-tea boys mm -hmm. like kind of this weird stereotype yeah. and it's like there's literally trans men of every color every um economic background i would say definitely exactly. like reach out and talk to all different types of trans men i mean i even know trans men that this might be a little controversial i know trans men that for all intensive purposes are you know they pass 100 percent, and they will sometimes wear women's clothing just because they want to um you know so literally i would just take the time to you know figure out what your character is about and essentially just go from there and of course have your um have like sensitivity readers and do your research as well so yes I have said it better myself. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I think that's um, a good point. You definitely don't want to have like stereotypical things, right? You want a dynamic character. So making the trans character like have a job and a life and everything, obviously, <laughs> I would hope, um, you know, not the main focus, but also like um, maybe making them like a person of color or someone with a disability, like, uh, you know, something that uh, is, is meshing other parts of life into the character, right? You want a very dynamic character when you're writing something. Um, and going back to my first point, like, obviously, if you're uh, doing a minority or an experience you haven't lived yourself, or you're not an expert in a certain topic, uh read a book call an expert ask your friend hey uh you know you're trans or you're disabled or you're whatever uh like 
how how would how would you could you read this for me you know is this does this accurate is this not stereotypical is this you know your experience would you feel comfortable okay. reading this it's super super important to have like editors and people overlooking things before you go from rough draft to book or uh whatever <laughs> type of writing mm -hmm. um what was your first gender euphoria um the side comment under that sort of what was the sign that pushed you into final realization that you were trans was it an actor character or something else that made you realize you're trans um you know how was your first like gender euphoria type of moment <laughs> I'll go first. Um, <laughs> so for me, <laughs> I was about this tall. So like, what was that? Like two for two or three feet? I can't really act. But yeah, I was about that tall, and I was watching mm -hmm. Nickelodeon and Danny Phantom. Hello, trans mask coded as heck. <laughs> Love Danny Phantom, having to hide from oh my gosh. all the time. Yes. Me being short, the bullying it was. <laughs> But honestly, just wanting to be just one of the guys kind of thing and just wanting to do what I felt like I wanted to do. Um, it, there was nothing much else to it. I didn't have the vocabulary at the time. I didn't know what trans was. I just always felt like I want to be more like that. And I started dressing that way, started acting more that way, was socialized around a lot of other guys and stuff. And yeah. Um, didn't find out that I was trans until I was an adult. <laughs> Once I got, learned the vocabulary, I'm like, oh, that's what that's called. <laughs> and and now I'm here. <laughs> Pongo. Uh gender euphoria moment. Oh, okay. um, I had um an experience where I had basically uh went to like an open it was like a farm field like grassy area with someone i was dating at the time and we were driving around uh and i was like you know what i've never done before and they were like what and i was like been shirtless in public and this is the perfect opportunity <laughs> um because no one's in the river miles and we're in the middle of farmland there's not even a cow to witness this so i won't be embarrassed and i ran out of the car and I threw off my binder and shirt and I ran through that field and the wind hit my chest for the very first time. And I cried. I sobbed like an absolute baby and I loved it. <laughs> um, that, Yay. I think I'm going to remember that moment forever, honestly. <laughs> Maybe top surgery will beat that. But no, that was a beautiful moment. Um, and I don't think I'm going to forget that. <laughs> Oh, that's great. That's really powerful. <laughs> and uh, for my gender euphoric uh, moment, I actually have two. One was when I was a lot younger. Uh, yes, I am very old. Stop it. Um, <laughs> even though I don't sound old. Um, I was watching Sailor Moon and seeing Sailor Ur uh, Uranus on the screen is one of my first. Oh, what's this? How is this how little uh, Mel feels? That was one. And then <laughs> another one was. <laughs> Uh, and then another one was when I was in college. This was like towards uh, when I started being on T and everything. I actually did. Um, I was a writer for this fashion magazine uh, called Dapper Q. Um, it's just an online magazine for um, queer oh fashion. Gosh, I've heard of that. And I, <laughs> yes, and um, I did. I did a photo shoot. A dapper photo shoot and I just grabbed a bunch of my other queer friends and I'm like we're going to the forest and we're going to do this dapper photo shoot and it's a picnic and they're like that okay so cool. and they just all went with me <laughs> and everyone regardless of gender was wearing bow ties and fancy argyle socks it was it was great it was a sight to see and in my outfit I was wearing a bow tie a vest 
uh, set of trousers and also kind of like a um, a flat cap to sort of pull the ensemble together. And I looked very dapper and I was like, yes, this is how I wish to dress all the time. I love this. I hope when I am on testosterone, like forever, well, you know what I mean, when I'm on uh, T for a while and I I need I need to have a dress up day again so I could be a dapper gentleman. Yes. Oh, yes. that's <laughs> wonderful. Oh, All right. Loading. So hold on, it's loading. All right. Uh, we're going to skip a slide here for time. Oop, let me go back one. Hello. Um, oh, crud. We already answered that one. Okay. This will be our last question. Um, what has been your favorite part of transitioning so far? Um, um, hmm. Go for it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let me actually check something really quick. Um, honestly, for me, just being able to dress the way that I want to dress, just expressing myself to the full extent, being out to my family, just being my true self has been life-saving. It has been everything that I could have imagined. Um, and also testosterone for me, it, it's case by case. It acts as an antidepressant as well. It's been, it's been helping my Lexapro out so much. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just, Felt. I'm just much happier. I just, <laughs> I smile brighter. It's weird. I never smiled for my teeth before. Oh, this isn't a dentist commercial kind of thing. I just, I'm, I feel <laughs> like myself. I, I never thought I can get here, and I'm really happy that I'm here, and I'm still getting to where I want to be too. So, yeah, just, that's just wonderful. Everything. <laughs> um, yeah, I was gonna actually say something similar. I mean, obviously, HRT isn't you know, an actual mental health med, but I feel like transitioning definitely significantly helped my confidence and my overall like well-being. Um, I used to hate f photographs of myself. Like I used to absolutely run away from my mom trying to take a photo of me. I would cry. I'd cover my face. I would run hysterically. No photos, I would say, every single day. No photos at Christmas or Easter. Or, you know, first day of school photos, I was like, no way in heck, and my mom would have to bribe me. Well, after transitioning a little bit, uh, wearing the clothes I wanted, feeling a little more comfortable in my body, having supportive um, people in my life, I felt a little bit better and, you know, started, you know, like maybe posting a selfie as a profile picture or, you know, sharing a photo of what I'm wearing for the day with a friend. Um, and that has like improved my mental health a lot by being able to feel more confident in myself, meeting new people or dating or things like that. Um, mm -hmm. that's like definitely. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say like segueing from what you said about, you know, dating and stuff. I would say like my favorite part about transitioning for me personally, I, yes, positive effects on HRT and going on testosterone. You know, I no longer have this weird, like nasally annoying female voice that gives me like dysphoria all the time. Like I can tolerate my voice, like hearing myself, like, you know, hearing yourself on a phone or on something could be a little bit jarring, but I mean, describing the dysphoria of hearing your own voice is really something else and now it's like you know is my voice a hundred percent of where it it needs to be or wherever i would like i should say where where i would like it to be no but at the same time you know it's it's a lot more tolerable to me um and i would say another favorite part of transitioning as well is that you know i'm finally you know, living the life that I knew as, you know, being a gay man and being out and, you know, having other men attracted to me, right? I mean, granted, there are people that, you know, 
do you have a problem with me being trans? Well, that's neither here nor there. You know, <laughs> I used to literally, you know, no, seriously, I used to like be all sad and be like, oh no, but you know, now I have their you know, a lovely partner <laughs> that that loves me very much and sees me as the man I am. And I mean, that is so Aww. affirming, you know? Yes, exactly. yes. You definitely have to surround yourself with people that are affirming. Um, okay, last slide. This is a thank you for coming to the panel. Um, and I also wanted to mention before we leave that there is a Tiltify donation link. Uh, all the donations are for Trans Academy. Uh, just a reminder, if you have the means to do it, uh, donate or share the link to all your friends and everyone you know. It really helps the community so we can put on a Oh no. <laughs> We're back. We're back. <laughs> Maybe oh, not God. Pongs. Oh. Okay. <laughs> well, there is a donation link. It should be in the bottom right of your screen if you're watching this from a stream. And <laughs> thank you for coming and to the panel. Also, These are we really Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, the, oh, no. Okay. Anyways, no. he's um, gone. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so there are uh, some thank yous that others have written for us, th thanking us for awesome and yeah. all that stuff. But yeah, we do read your feedback. Yes, this is... Um, and I was going to say, this is from the in... Discord group. So, yep. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs>